Welcome to CSA Biology TCP. I am Mr. Wilson from the TCP Academy. You may find us on YouTube at CSA Biology TCP or online. You can find us at tcp-academy.teachable.com. You may send us a mail at extremesolutionsja at gmail.com. This publication is meant for persons who are on the TCP website or at the TCP Academy. It is, of course, for our private candidate. This is a May June 2021 examination. We would have done pieces of it and it's on YouTube, but for this, it's going to be sent directly to those persons who are registered to our private platform. You want to stay with us as we go through this paper, and we are going to try to assist you with some questions that are somewhat associated with the broad topics for the exam year. 2022 so if you don't know as yet then you need to go to my website youtube that it is and make sure you know what broad topics are supposed to be covered so question number one here falls in the broad topics that are supposed to be covered for the exam year 2022 it reads table one shows some of the steps involved in the bird process complete the table by correctly numbering each step to show the correct order in the broad process so here we go now it is has is given there and you can take a screenshot uh the first thing that is going to happen you are going to have the release of oxytocin followed by this rhythmic contraction which will of course result in the baby being pushed through the cervix and of course then the vagina then for three we're going to be having the baby being expelled head first now following that we're going to be having the expulsion of the placenta now you can tell us in the comments below if you have something different and we can talk about that in a civil manner in our chat there the other thing we need to look at here is of course birth why is this happening we're supposed to state two reliable methods of birth control. And of course, there are several methods, but we chose a condom and interuterine devices. Now, these are reliable methods of birth control, and you could probably have something different, but it will definitely work once it falls among the birth controls that are on your syllabus, are uh, those that are tested and recorded somewhere out there in some reputable Table 2 shows data collected in five Caribbean countries comparing the number of live births of women who attended antenatal clinic versus those women who did not attend the antenatal clinic. Table 2 data on live birth rates per 100 women. Now the first column here we are looking at the country and then of course the other two columns are looking at live birth rate for those persons who attended the clinic versus those who did not attend the clinic. The countries that we're looking at, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname. Now we're supposed to answer this question that values five marks. On the grid provided on page seven, plot a bar graph to show the live birth rates of the number of women who attended antenatal clinics and the women who did not attend the antenatal clinic for each country shown in table one now just before we do that we're going to be looking at a question that follows then we're going to be looking at the table now state which country had the highest number of live birth as a result of your women attending the antenatal clinics so we can just look at the table here and persons who are attending there in the first column women who attended the antenatal clinic and the highest number we have here is 85 and that is of course from trinidad and tobago so our answer there nicely would have been trinidad and Tobago. Then we move on down to the other question, which says so just one reason why some countries had low live birth rates, even though their women attended the antenatal clinics. Interested to know that they might have attended the antenatal clinic, but they might have used drugs, example, alcohol, cigarette, cocaine, you name it. And those could have actually uh, affected the birth. Now they might have been exposed to even infection and these could have probably led to stillbirth. So though they attended the clinic, they could still be at fault because they're not following the guidelines from the clinic. We're asked to put the information in the table on, on the graph. 
But the first thing we need to know what goes where. The information, the independent variable goes on the x-axis. And usually it is found in the first column of your table. Now it's very important to note that your graph is supposed to have a name and we're going to get this name from the name that was used for the title of the table. Just changing it to graph showing the data on live birth per 100 women. Then we are going to of course need to have a key because we're using different color code to deal with those persons who attended clinic versus those who did not attend clinic. Those who attended clinic are in yellow, those who did not are in green. Now it's important to note here that this is not so much to scale but we are pretty much teaching concept as I was not able to really get this smack on. But you're going to see that it's going to be pretty close and you can pretty much uh, work on that. So for the first country, Grenada, we're going to be sliding up and down. So for Grenada, let's look at what's happening here. So it was, let's just look in the table here. In the table, Grenada, it was 60. I was not so scale, to scale with the coloring, but 60 should have been on the gray line. This line here, a solid black line. So the, this is where the yellow mark should have stopped. Ensure that in your exam, you do not go over this line or else you'll be losing marks. Then we're going to be having, I think the other thing is 45 for those who did not. So it's 60 to 45. Let us look at that. Oh, 60 to 46. So we did a little bit of work here with that. So it is 60. And of course, 46 should have been this line immediately above the dark line. But again, I'm using my fingers to just draw this cursor thing and it might not be as accurate. So make sure that you look here. They should fall on the line. Each of these lines, these small lines here, represent one. So we'd have 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And then the solid line here would have been 25. So we're using the color code. Now, another thing I want to point out is that it asks us to do a bar graph. Now, bar graph for the average person, they might say that the bar graphs are not to touch. But here the bar graphs much touch because this is considered to be a cluster bar graph. So we are looking at two sets of data for Grenada, two sets of data for Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Suriname. And as such, the data comes together to form a single column. So here you are going to have the data being touched. However, you will have a space between them, and that's how the space will come. So you could have a cluster bar graph like we're having here, or it could be a regular bar graph that the bars really don't touch. So this is not an histogram. It's not an histogram. It is definitely a bar graph. Make sure that you're labeling your axis countries on the X, and of course, live birth per 100 women on the Y. So you can look at that, and you can give me some suggestions in the comment how I could perfect my graph, but I do hope you understand the concept that has been taught here. Let's move right on. Hope you understand very well what we did there. A follow-up study was conducted on women who attended the antenatal clinic to determine the health of the mothers and their babies. The study showed that the mothers who breastfed their babies were healthier and so were the babies so just one reason for good health in the breastfeeding mother and one reason for good health in the breastfeeding babies the breastfed babies sorry now breastfeeding stimulate the uterus to contract thus returning the uterus to normal now another thing that it does it reduces the risk of breast and ovarian cancer and it also reduces the bleeding that comes after birth, which is, of course, due to the contraction. So all that there is to the mother. Now, to the baby, the breast milk contains antibodies which protect the baby against bacteria and viral diseases. So there we're seeing that breastfeeding is very, very important. Important to note is that breast milk has a needed nutrient in the correct proportion. And might I say, it is a warm meal being served when we give that to the baby. Just enough for the enzymes to operate and ensure that the baby is at optimum health. Question number two, figure one shows a diagram of part of a food chain, organism X, and we have an arrow A, organism Y, and then an arrow A, organism Z. And then we have a, a B below that arrow, oxygen and carbon dioxide. We are tasked, state what the arrow labeled 
A represent in figure one. Arrow A shows the flow of energy. Uh, one might say it tells which organism is doing the eating. So here, Y would be eating X. Let's move on to the other question. State what is occurring at the arrow labeled B. Now, this is pretty much an unusual arrow, but oxygen going in, carbon dioxide coming out, it's easy. It tells us that that's respiration. The other question here says, identify the organism that is the primary consumer and the organism that is the producer in the food chain above. Now, make sure that you're paying attention here primary consumer that's going to be the second organism in your food chain and here the second organism in our food chain is organism y and the producer is going to be organism x nicely stated here we move on to the other question and of course the food chain could be a part of your exam being that it looks at nutrition stacy walks into her into her garden and see mealybugs feeding on the leaves of her grown plant to protect the plant, she introduces the ladybugs to eat the mealybugs. Stacy becomes upset when she notice, notices a frog eating her recently purchased ladybugs. Later that day, Stacy sees a garden snake eating the frog. Construct a food chain to represent the information provided in this scenario above. Now, of course, the leaf of a ladybug eaten by the mealybugs, the mealybugs being eaten by the ladybugs, the frog eating the ladybugs, and then the snake doing the final eating there. So there we can see a flow of energy from the leaf pretty much to the snake, and it is, of course, a unidirectional flow of energy from producer the consumer here we're seeing five trophic levels as each organism represents a trophic level be reminded that the arrow shows the flow of energy uh, one might say what's doing the eating so here the meter bug is eating the leaf the ladybug is eating the meter bug and the frog eating the ladybug and the snake eating the frog next question a month later stacy find the garden snake dead and decompose, decomposing in her yard. Name two types of organism that would be responsible for the snake decay. Here one might be looking at decomposers and vegetable, but it says decay, decay, so it's easy for us to go a little narrower. We can say bacteria and fungi, they are responsible for decomposition and of course the cycling of nutrients. Stacy removed the dead snake from her yard and instead of throwing it in the bush, buries it near the root of a croton plant. Explain how stasis action would be beneficial to the croton plant. The action of the decomposers will release trapped nutrient from the snake to the soil. The plant will then, through its root and active transport, obtain the nutrient from the soil and use this nutrient to enhance the growth and development of a plant including the fruit and leaves and stem all would benefit from that nutrient that is garnered from the dead snake other question state whether or not stacy would have the same number of snake in her yard as frogs now this question is asking us to look at the pyramid of number pyramid of energy pyramid of biomass all those come to mind when we see a question like this now our answer is definitely going to be uh no, uh, the, it would have been less snake because as you move up the trophic level, you find that there's less organism because those below will have to sustain life above. So hence we have to have less organism at, as we move through the trophic level and up the trophic level. So Stacy would have less snake than she would have had frogs. Remember, snakes are feeding on the frogs. Question number three, figure two shows a cross section of the skin. And this, of course, is going to be excretion, so this might not be on your paper. We are tasked to identify each structure labeled A and B. So A, of course, we looked at that, and it was very easy to identify. It is the air erector muscle. So when we're having a difference in temperature, it could cause the air on the skin to become erect. Are pretty much just to lay down on the skin the other thing we're looking at there is a sweat block not so much a sweat gland the set gland would have been a, a closer knit coil but that there shows us a duct through which the sweat is moving to the skin next question complete the paragraph below by selecting the two correct response from the words 
and phrase provided in the box below. So here are the words that we have negative feedback mechanism, positive feedback mechanism, control of body temperature, control um childbirth. Now important to note that with negative feedback mechanism, what is happening is that the corrective measure is going in the opposite uh, direction of the problem. With positive feedback mechanism, it is going in the direction of what is happening. So let's read what's happening here. Homostasis is a way in which con in which constant condition are maintained in the body despite changes in the environment. When the body de detects changes within its environment and produces a response to bring back to normal, so it's going the other way, is described as negative feedback mechanism. An example of this mechanism is the control of body temperature, asthma regulation, control of blood sugar. All those are examples of, of course, negative feedback mechanism. On the other hand, if a woman was given birth and the contraction there, more oxytocin would have been secreted and that would have been an example of a positive feedback mechanism, which is definitely not applicable to this question. We move on to the other question here. It says state two responses which occur in the body when carbon dioxide level in the blood increases. This is going to be really interesting and easy for many persons because at sports day when you are running and the car, or you feel uh, temperature increasing, you are breathing deeper, the heart rate has increased, all these are going to be happening if the carbon dioxide level in the blood is increased. Our answer, the blood will become more acidic, interesting to note. Uh, this will cause the intercostal muscle to adjust the rate and depth of breathing. Thus, the individual will breathe faster and deeper. There will also be increase in the heart rate or the beating of a heart. And of course, the persons might breathe with mouth open or breathe a panting breathing. The body temperature will be up. The person will be sweating. All of those are things that are likely to happen once the carbon dioxide level is up in the blood. But more so, remember the acidity or increased acidity of the blood. Another question here for us to look at. A group of friends go to a party and drink excessive amount of alcoholic beverages which are rich in carbohydrate. After drinking they experience frequent urination and the following day suffers from extreme thirst. It's interesting to note here or important to note that alcoholic beverages are diuretic so what they do they cause you to urinate more. Explain why the friends experience each of the following signs and symptoms. Frequent urination. Alcohol is a diuretic. Hence, it increases the excretion of water by the kidney. This may lead to dehydration if the water is not replaced. Now, extreme thirst as a result of a high water loss due to the diuretic, it causes the individual to feel thirsty are extremely thirsty and of course this lost water must be compensated for so naturally the person will need water to drink we move on to the other question and it says here in addition to frequent urination the extreme thirst one of the friends pedro experienced dizzy spells and lactergy the next day state the effect that drinking alcoholic beverage would have on Pedro's blood glucose level. Well, initially, because the high, glu the high carbohydrate glucose that will be derived, energy that will be derived from the carbohydrate, you will have an initial rise in blood sugar level. Then it will naturally cause the blood sugar level to fall below the normal level uh, of our blood sugar. The other question here, explain how Pedro's body would respond to eliminate the effect stated. So he's suffering from a condition, now blood sugar is lower than what it should be, hypoglycemia. So the pancreas will secrete glucagon into the blood and the liver cells will break down stored glycogen into glucose and release it into the blood. This increases the blood glucose or blood sugar level thus he will that will help to restore that lost energy and that feeling of lethargy and dizziness so just the disease that pedro is most likely suffering from and state why why he would have experienced this this spell and lethargy now here the easy thing to select is diabetes 
Yes, a person with diabetes can suffer from hypoglycemia. But based on what I would have read in this question, I'm not seeing anything there to indicate that this person is suffering from diabetes. However, if you have found something different, you can leave it in the comment below and I will definitely revisit this. So I think that this person is suffering from hypoglycemia. Uh, glucose is the main source of energy for the body. When the levels of glucose goes down, it results in a shortfall in the energy needed by the body, which leads to dizziness and lethargy. So, of course, if we increase that glucose level, then we could overcome that hypoglycemia. We move on to question number four. Four and question number four begins with a table and this table is a table of controversy and if you have a different answer kindly leave it in the comments below i'll be happy to have a discussion with you around this particular table now table three shows a step involved in large-scale purification of water from a dam complete table three by numbering each step in the process in the correct order one step has been numbered for you now steps in large-scale water purification the first thing that comes to me when i see this question dam this is going to be portable water second thing water purification my brain is lean to one side so i am looking at purification of drinking water but when i look at this table there are two words in this table that pretty much throw this thing out and point labeled five and four also threw it out so when i looked at let us look at point number four air mixed vigorously into tanks with waste water that pretty much brought me to the activated sludge method of dealing with sewage treatment and then Coming after that would have been disposal of the effluent, which is a term which is popularly used in sewage management. When I answered one, three, and look at two, I was pretty close to saying that this is a processing of drinking water. And then the fact that we have, I think, sedimentation missing from this uh, treatment of sludge, it would have been a lot of person's problem. I'm not too sure if there's any other vlogger out there who would have answered this question, but if you're seeing a different answer, send it to me. I definitely want to see the interpretation of others. But for me, it's going to be the activated sludge method, and you're seeing it right above there I would have written. So we would have first removal of non-biodegradable material. We know that we dispose everything in our sewage, and it ends up at the sewage treatment plant. Then we are going to have the large particles and grit uh, sand settle. Now, this, this is like textbook. So, for those persons who are wondering, is this actually portable water that we are pretty much treating? No, it is sewage. But isn't treating sewage still the treat, uh, treatment of water? Tell me in the comments below. So, Say two ways in which human activity could negatively impact water supply. Now, we could have over-harvesting of water, which would have led to a number of wells being uh, abandoned in Kingston. We could have over-harvesting of, of water, as is seen in the Ariel Sea, where the sea went dry or the lake went dry. Now, deforestation reduces, and it says state here, so I should have just said deforestation, but I'm continuing with some explanation to assist those persons who need to understand why. So, deforestation uh, reduces transpiration, so it started putting out a bridge there in the water cycle, and precipitation that should pretty much replenish our water sources like our aquifers, our streams, and so on. Now, release of harmful waste are effluent in our water bodies. That's another thing. And my explanation, which is not needed because it says state, thus reducing the amount of water available for consumption you would have known about the minimata disease with the mercury leaking there in the water making the water not fit for consumption we move on to the other question leah lives in rural village where most residents may be living by raising animals and growing crops Grows it growing crops pesticide raising animals feces Recent rains have left the village flooded and Leah plays in the flood water. From early in the morning to late in the evening, Leah is a naughty girl and I'm sure 
child services will be looking for her parents. See two contaminants that Leah and her community could be exposed to after the flood. Two contaminants, pathogens. And pathogens are going to be in about five forms. You are going to have, well, pathogens, they come as virus, they come as fungus, they come as bacteria, they come as worm, they come as protozoa. So pathogens, these are, of course, are contaminants that they will be exposed to. Another thing is that they could be exposed to pesticides. And pesticide is pretty much derivative from the crops would, would have been used to treat the crop or treat or to control pests. And pesticide refers to everything, rodenticide, herbicide, insecticide, all those are pesticides. And these are very, very dangerous. We didn't need to say this because it says state. But I just want you to know that these can probably affect the nervous system and the endocrine system, pretty much throwing off how the body functions. So just three diseases that Leah and her community are likely to contract as a result of Flooding. Now they could contract typhoid, fever, cholera, and of course gastroenteritis. Now we don't need to say anything here. All we needed to do was to suggest, and we did suggest. But here we need to recommend four precautions that the residents could take during the flooding crisis to prevent the spread of the disease. <laughs> what are your precautions? Boiling water for 10 to 20 minutes before you. So if you are going to be drinking that water, you want to make sure you bring that water to a bubble and have it there for about 10 to 20 minutes before you cool and, of course, drink. Make sure that you filter this water before you go boiling. Apply bleach to the water at a rate of one teaspoon to a liter of water. Now, this is not the diluted bleach, so make sure that the bleach that you are using is a bleach that is well labeled, tested by your Bureau of Standard, and is appropriate for this type of a purpose. Add chlorine tablets. This is another option. At a rate of 500 milligrams to 20 liters of water before use. Make sure that you are following the prescribed guideline so that you are not poisoning yourself or putting too much chlorine in the form of tablet or, of course, chlorinated bleach in the water. Redu Residents should avoid entering flooded area avoid playing in that water layer and i'm reaching out to layer parents that if you are not careful i'm sure child services is on their way because leah should not be playing in this water because it poses so much threat to leah and your family now ensure protective footwear is worn when you are going outside so if leah needs to run to the shop and she's not going to be going into that flooded area and she has to walk in that area you need to make sure that leah is of course wearing protective footwear she could be exposed to worm which is of course a pathogen and you really don't want that to happen we move on to the other question and this is question number five the human skeleton is made up of approximately 206 bones however if you look at a baby in comparison to an adult you'd see a difference in bones and that is because the bones are not fused in the baby now identify two bones located in the chest region of the skeleton now the sternum that flat bone in the center of the chest is one of those bones and connecting to the sternum are some ribs so the ribs are also bones that are located in the chest region of the human now stay two function of a skeletal system other than movement that's so many functions so your answer might not be as mine so it's responsible for protection of body organs like the skull is protecting the, the brain the sternum is protecting the heart and the ribcage along and all that, that sort of a thing now it's also responsible for the production of blood cell and it also helps to keep the body upright and it says that we are not supposed to look at movement. So make sure you look at that and not give an answer that is associated with movement. Compare the movement of an inch joint with the movement of a ball and socket joint. You want to see my video on the skeletal system. Now, this is definitely not a part of the 22, 22 exam paper 2, but we had to answer for the paper. Inch joints allow movement in one plane, while ball and socket joints allow movement in a rotational 
manner in all planes. See my video on joints and you'll learn all about that. Another question here. After class, Tina was having an argument about ligaments and tendons. She believed that ligaments and tendons are the same because both are made up of connective tissue and are attached to bones. Interesting here. Explain why Tina's belief was not entirely accurate. Now, important to note, uh, Tina, is that ligaments connect bones to bones, usually at the joint. They allow for some amount of movement as they have some amount of elasticity. Now, they have some amount of elasticity while tendons connect muscles to bone. They are non-elastic. And why they are non-elastic? Because they ensure that the muscle contract when force is applied. Hence, while they may be tough connective tissue, Tina, their function differ, so to their makeup. I hope I provide enough information and will pretty much bring you to a point of understanding the difference between the tendon and the ligament. We're looking at another question here. It says a middle-aged man goes to the clinic complaining of stiff, painful joints and decrease in mobility. So just the condition from which he most likely suffers and explain how he may have developed this condition. It's likely he's suffering from arthritis. This is due to damage in the joints caused by obesity, injury, family history, or probably the rigors due to eating. These lead to cartilage being worn out, thus increasing friction in the joint and causing pain. Soon it reduces mobility in the joint and reduces mobility in the individual. These are some of the things from uh, arthritis on the joint. You want to make sure that you keep your body mass in check. You want to also find out a little about your family history. This is something that is considered to be inherited as well. Stay two examples of continuous variation and discontinuous variation. And this is question number six and the final question for your 2021 paper. Now, continuous variation tends to have a midpoint. 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. So there's some intermediate there. So the length of your hair, the mass of an individual, uh, the color of the skin, there are different degrees. Those are all in continuum. So they are continuous variation. With this continuous variation, it is somewhat absolute. So if you look at your earlobe, it's either attached or detached. You could either have freckle face or there's no freckle. You could have cleft chin or there is no cleft chin. You may be right-handed or left-handed. You may be boy or you may be girl. So it is distinct. There is no in-between that maybe it is so. Now, stay two reasons why genetic variation is important to organism. It ensures a better chance for the survival of that species. Two, it allows for the most suitable members of that species to be included in the future species gene pool. So we are going to be having the best of the best moving off, moving on. As Charles Darwin would say, the fittest of a fittest will survive, and that is as a result of variation. The weakling will fall food to other organisms. I will just naturally be removed from the gene pool by natural death. Now, it is Egypt time mosquito lives in warm climate and lays its egg in stagnant water. Meteorologists predict that the Caribbean will have longer dry seasons, but when it rains, it would often result in flooding. Surprisingly, scientists predict that there could be an increase in the spread of mosquito-borne disease, diseases during the long dry seasons. Name the disease that the Aedes aegypti mosquito carries and identify one other mosquito-borne disease. Now, the Aedes aegypti would be carrying dengue fever, while malaria would be spread by the Anopheles. So that would nicely answer our question there. Explain why scientists are predicting 
that long dry season could increase the levels of mosquito-borne disease. This is going to be easy. During the long dry season, the temperature is ideal for these vectors to reproduce. There will be several areas of still water ideal for mosquito breeding. No rain means these breeding sites will not be affected, hence the mosquito will be able to complete its life cycle. And as such, we're going to be having more adult mosquitoes giving us trouble. Now, if we were able to break the life cycle by making all these stagnant water be removed, all these still water bodies uh, be treated or removed, then, of course, we'll have less mosquito. I'm sorry, but it is true that which the scientists would have said are the meteorologists. All right. Brendan is a 10-year-old boy who does not like to bathe. Oh, our change is dirty clothes. Aside from an awful body odor, explain to Brendan three health challenges he may experience as a result of these practices. Well, he could have acne, fungal infection, dermatitis, are some of the problems that are associated with not bathing. And I say some. Acne causes bump, which causes irritation. This will cause you to scratch, causing further skin problems. Dead cells and sweat provides food and breathing space for fungi, which eventually attack the skin, causing major skin problem if not treated. There may also be patches of sweat, dirt, dead cells leading to tough unattracted skin uh, condition we call dermatitis. This brings us to the end of this 2021 Human and Social Biology paper. For those persons who are going to be sitting exam for January or, of course, May, June, July, the next exam sitting, please be reminded you can reach me at one 219 5191 for classes, for labs, for assistance, of course, it's on our paid platform. I do hope that you will follow in our series, and of course, you'll be acing your exam. Again, this is the 2021 Human and Social Biology paper. That is, of course, the one that you might have been looking for. So, there we go. Last year, many students differed on their CXE exams as they were afraid of failure due to their level of readiness. This year, Mr. Wilson and his experienced team from tcpacademy.teachable.com is here to help you get exam ready. Subscribe for free to tcp-academy.teachable.com. We offer courses in CXE Biology, HSB, English Language, and many others. There are several offerings to each course. Enroll in one today. Get help with CSET Biology SBA Labs and Human and Social Biology SBA Labs at tcp-academy.com.